Thanks, Kelly. Hi, everybody. Uh, now, what we're going to do is uh, split the talk up into uh, three parts here. I'm going to give sort of the broad general overview, including uh, the founding impetus for the foundation, and uh, talk a little bit about why uh, philanthropy, non-religious philanthropy, is an especially urgent uh, topic to be talking about right now. And then uh, Noel and Jude will introduce their portions. Uh, they're going to be talking about more of the brass tacks, uh, down to the specifics of, uh, of our programs. Uh, so I want to start off by saying um, there is a stat that I include in talks like this. I have for about 10 years. I say that uh, churchgoers, regular churchgoers, give two to three times as much to charity as non-churchgoers. And you just broke my record because usually when I say that, somebody interrupts angrily, <laughs> they stand up and say, yeah, but, and they say all the yeah, buts, which are real. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, caveats uh, to that. People say, you know, most of that money goes to the church, so it shouldn't count. It's not really charity, or most of it is wasted, which is true, or they're lying about what they give, or Bill Gates gives a lot of money, or, you know, something like that. But the fact is the figure has been verified by some pretty robust uh, instruments, two to three times as much giving by regular churchgoers as by non-churchgoers. Uh, the reason that we tend to jump up and interrupt somebody who says that is because it's been used as a bludgeon against us for so many years. It is tied to virtue. Uh, Arthur Brooks, the, cult, the conservative commentator, called it a, a evidence of a gap in virtue between the religious and the non-religious, and that's ridiculous. Uh, the fact is, I would be shocked if the stat weren't true. I would be flabbergasted if we gave the same as somebody who's going to church 52 times a year. Now, that's the thing to notice, first of all, is that the stat is not about religious belief. It's about the measurable activity of walking into a building every Sunday. That's different. I was a church-going atheist for 25 years for various reasons. Uh, my uh, series of jobs that I had, a uh, girlfriend that I had, uh, my wife, same, same person. I never believed a thing they were saying. I was certainly never inspired to give by what they were saying. I had reasons to not give. I had every incentive to not give. And yet when that shiny plate passed in front of me, every time I gave. And then about 20 years ago, I stopped going to church. And my charitable giving, when I was filling out my taxes the next year, my charitable giving had fallen off a cliff. And my beliefs didn't change, my virtue didn't change, right? What changed was the systematic encounter with that plate passing in front of me like clockwork. I had been part of a systematic culture of giving. And the fact that the money was being wasted, that it went to BS that I didn't support, that's hugely important, but it's a separate question from the question of individual giving. And I speak at Unitarian fellowships all the time and ethical societies all the time. These are places brimming with atheists. And when that offering plate passes by, I give and so do they. It's not about religious virtue. It's about systematic opportunities to engage philanthropy. Now, if the opportunity can be tied to the values of a community, that's even better, right? You can inspire people to act out their values in this support. There's been good sociology done on that. That's actually effective. But the systematic opportunity is the linchpin. Now, add the fact that three million people a year are walking away from the churches, walking away from that charitable giving system like I did. Obviously good news in several ways. And it's even good news for giving in one way I'll get to in a minute. In 1987, listen to this stat. In 1987, 53% of the charitable giving in the United States went to churches. 53%. By 2015, that was down to 32%. In one generation, it went from more than half to less than a third that was going through the churches. That is really good news. But the downside of that is the people who are walking away from the churches are probably having their charitable giving fall off a cliff just like mine did. In 2013, the Philanthropy Roundtable found that people who attended church at least half of the Sundays in a given year gave an average of $2,900 a year to charitable causes. 
while those who had zero shiny plates passing in front of them gave around $704 a year, less than a fourth. And of course, a lot of the $2,900 is wasted on ministers' salaries and choir robes and missionaries and youth trips and Bible camps, yes. That's the good news in the decline of church giving. But the question is this, could we get non-religious giving to the level of church giving without the waste, without the toxic messages, and without the lion's share being siphoned off by those things? Think about charitable giving as a discretionary tax. Actual taxes are mandatory, right? They pay for things that we have collectively decided are important through our terrible political process, right? We don't do a good job with it, but in theory, those taxes are an expression of our shared concerns. Charitable giving is about those things that we haven't agreed on. So if it's important to you, if it expresses your values, you give. And people often gather together with others who share those values and give collectively through organizations set up for that purpose. Until recently, these organizations have primarily been churches. So churches had not only the lion's share of giving, and here is one of the key points, they also had the lion's share of values expressed, expressed by that charitable giving. But something really significant happened two days ago. I don't know if you saw it in the news. The Gallup organization released a poll showing that U.S. church membership has fallen to 50% of the population and plummeting. That's a major landmark. They are losing their grip on the conversation and on the expression of values through giving. So the question is, can we adopt the best aspects of their systematic giving culture without the toxins, without the waste, so that our humanistic values can be more powerfully expressed in the world? That was the question that launched Foundation Beyond Belief 10 years ago. We select a slate of nonprofits doing great work in education, poverty and health, human rights, and the natural world, and then donors sign up for a regular monthly donation in the amount of their choice. That's the plate passing by, right? That regular donation. And then we tell compelling stories about the great work of these organizations. And at the end of each quarter, we send grants to them and start over with a new slate. That was the giving model that we started with. And in the first quarter, we raised $11,000 for these organizations, that number has steadily increased over the years. And as of this quarter, Foundation Beyond Belief's humanist and atheist donors have raised over $2.5 million for 130 organizations. So the giving program is where we started. That was first. But then in 2011, Japan was hit by a massive tsunami. And a lot of our donors said, uh, hey, we should have a disaster drive. And I said, we're not set up for that kind of thing. And they said, we should be set up for this kind of thing. So we quickly vetted organizations, we found a beneficiary, and we launched a drive and raised over $20,000 in three weeks for tsunami recovery. That start eventually became our humanist disaster recovery program with drives for natural disasters and famine relief. And now we've got on the ground disaster recovery teams as well. And then a lot of donors said, hey, wouldn't it be great to create a support network for volunteering in communities around the U.S.? So we formed Volunteers Beyond Belief, which is now the Beyond Belief Network. Noel will talk about this in more detail in a minute. But it started with just five teams working in their towns. And now we have over 125 teams across the United States working in their local communities. And then uh, a lot of donors said, hey, wouldn't it be great to have an international service corps? And I said, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That'd be great. There's no way we're going to be able to do that. But then we got a substantial grant. And we got the leadership of Connor Robinson, who was a humanist who was already planning such a thing. And the Humanist Service Corps was born. We've now had two full years of deployment in Ghana. Jude will talk more about that program. So now we have a four-program humanistic charitable engagement uh, with these, these four different types of philanthropic engagement. <clears throat> this is our experiment. And the reason it's a crucial time to be doing this is that this is a critical 
time in human history for charitable engagement, for that discretionary engagement. Climate change is the reason. Climate change is already deepening the divide in the world between the haves and the have-nots. And as that worsens, we have to ask what our responsibility is as privileged people in a privileged country toward those whose lives are going to be decimated by what's coming. And a lot of organizations that are unaffiliated with religion are doing great work in that direction already. But can we scale up this specifically humanistic effort, this specific organization of the non-religious, to step into the role that is being evacuated by the shrinking churches? I'll leave that dangling question in the air as I turn it over to Noel, Executive Director of Foundation Beyond Belief. I'll take this one. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Good. Uh, thank you, Dale. I, my name is Noelle George. I took over the executive director role from Dale in 2015. And I'm going to talk to you about how I came to be with Foundation Beyond Belief and why working in philanthropy is important to me. And I'm going to talk to you about the importance of ensuring that we are putting uh, partnership and teamwork before, uh, before the some of the challenges that we have in interpersonal dynamics. I'm going to talk to you about team building and team dynamics, team theory. Um, so uh, the, the way that I came to be with Foundation Beyond Belief is I had actually started a, a charity. I had moved to Houston from Seattle, and I had considered myself an atheist for a long time, but never been involved in the community. And when I moved to Houston, there was a kind of a constant, where do you go to church? And you can meet people through your church. And I, found, I, I, I had the need to find my people. And I, I searched around, went to various meetups, and found my people, and my people were the atheist groups, but I went to the meetings and it was talk, mostly just talk about, oh, is there a God? Isn't there a God? What's happening? And I'm kind of a doer. I, I like to talk too, of course, but I, I'm, I'm more of a, do I like to get things done. So I thought, well, I'm going to start an organization here in Houston to do service in the community. And there was also this question back in 2009, where are the women? Where are the women? And I was like, well, maybe there would be more women if we had more diverse activities. So I thought, well, this will solve various problems. It will get um, atheists out into the community, visibly doing service. Um, and so I started this organization called Secular Center. And uh, I worked on that for several years until I was emailed by someone at Foundation Beyond Belief. Uh, we came into contact. We discovered that we were doing similar things, and, and that was great. And I came to a point in about uh, 2010 where I felt that it was time to uh, figure out how to do this better. I, um, we started having conversations, uh, Dale and I, about merging the organizations, merging our two organizations. And actually, at the time, there were quite a few different organizations doing philanthropy in the, in the secular community. There was uh, uh, AHA's program, Humanist Charities, American Humanist Association. Am I allowed to talk about other orgs here? I don't know, at the AA convention. Um, there was CFI Share, and uh, the last thing that, that they've done that I saw um, on their website was uh, raising money for the 2010 Haiti earthquake, so it's been a little while. Um, and also, the Richard Dawkins Foundation had started the Non-Believers Giving Aid. So all of the organizations that were doing philanthropy started having these discussions about let's uh, combine what we're doing. Let's do it more efficiency, efficiently. And the short version of this is that the talks pretty much fell apart. Um, and we were the only ones who ended up merging our organizations. <laughs> um, there were various reasons for that. But I want to talk a little bit about um, the challenges of, of doing that. I had started an organization. I was passionate about it. I believed in what it was doing. 
And I'm not going to pretend that it was easy for me to then merge that organization and go to work under Dale. You know, there are, there are feelings involved when you create an organization. And, um, you know, I had ideas, but through our conversations, uh, it was very clear that we had very similar views on uh, what the priorities were and, and how to do things. And um, Dale, uh, Dale's organization was a little more established. He was a lot more well-known than I was, and it just made sense. And um, I know that as we started to work together, there were definitely... Um, you know, things that we had to work out. But I joined the organization. I started, uh, I took over the Volunteers Beyond Belief program, which was kind of, uh, my organization merged into FBB to kind of create that program. And uh, the rest is history. So, um, and, and I don't, uh, I know that sometimes there are personality challenges or we have an idea for how we can do things and, um, it's easier to start a new group, or it's easier to go off and do your own thing. But I think despite whatever feelings we may have about working through those challenges, and it wasn't very difficult with Dale because, you know, he's so easygoing and great. Um, but uh, we need to think about the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is that um, we need to let go of the herding cats metaphor. We need to find ways to work together. We need to let go of our, uh, you know, the, the idea that we can do it better and figure out ways to partner together. And I think that we've done that uh, at Foundation Beyond Belief. And it's been, it's been to the great benefit of the organization. So. Thank you. It was difficult to give up something that I had worked hard on, but it was the best decision for the movement. When you, when you feel like you want to make a difference in the world, I think you really have to look at the best way to do that logically. I'm an engineer, so you know I'm trained in that kind of uh, looking for those opportunities to make things more efficient. And this uh, was one of those things. So um, especially as we come, uh, we come to the world of philanthropy and we have the churches and they're very established in this world. They kind of feel ownership of this world and it's assumed that, you know, if you're doing good, it's because you believe in God. Um, and Dale painted a great picture of the decline of, uh, of the churches, but actually, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a little discouraging for a minute because even though the, dis the churches are declining, they actually have a ton of resources. I don't know if you can, oh. Uh, they have a ton of resources. Where's my, I need my slide. Okay, oh, oh there it is, okay. So, who knows who the richest organization in the world is? Does anyone know? No. <laughs> now that, that may have changed since I pulled this data, but um, actually these are the two wealthiest organizations in the world. Um, the church, no longer the Mormon church, but the Church of Latter-day Saints and, um, and the Catholic Church. And if you think about it in a, a time frame scale, the atheist organizations, the secular organizations that are around today, it, uh, American Atheist was formed in the in the 50s, the 60s, 60s. Um, some other organizations were formed in the early 1900s. The religious organizations, not uh, most of them, were formed thousands of years ago. So they've got a big jump start on it. They've got a big head start on us. Um, this number for the Catholic Church doesn't actually include the value of properties. It just and it was last done in uh, the 60s. The last time the church was the Catholic Church was um, uh, researched the value and actually we got any good data I believe on the value of uh, the Catholic Church uh, as an organization was in the 60s. So you can imagine with all the economic change that we've had since the 60s and all the growth what that might look like. Um, if it were uh, if it were a really current number, um, 
So despite the decline in the churches, we still have a long way to go to even come close to the level of resources that they have here. So working together, working in partnership, which is something that I'm hugely passionate about and is something uh, that's a strong value at Foundation Beyond Belief, is going to be even more critical. Uh, working with organizations like American Atheists to ensure that we are doing the best work possible in the most efficient way. Um, it's not just about using the resources that we currently have wisely and efficient, efficiently. It's about collecting those resources efficiently together, about understanding where to put the resources to be the most effective. Um, and that's one of the things that Foundation Beyond Belief uh, over the last 10 years that we've been operating has been working on understanding and learning. Giving 35,000 here and 50,000 there and 15,000 there is great, but giving $100,000 together can accomplish more for, uh, for a specific cause. So it's more efficient and it also raises more awareness for the work. So we're looking at ways to um, continue to increase our efficiency. And this year is our 10th year anniversary, which is very exciting. Oh. Thank you. And we're poised in a position now even more than before to be able to uh, look at how we are doing philanthropy and with the experience and the knowledge that we've gained over the past 10 years, um, really transform the landscape of philanthropy. So uh, I'm really excited about that. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about um, about team building, because one of the challenges that we have in the secular community is that, um, for the most part, we're, we're volunteer organizations. Local groups are volunteer organizations. And I don't know if you have, uh, if you've done much in your local group, you probably know that there are personalities, um, various different personalities, there are challenges, there are conflicts. And um, it does, do any of you know about team theory, game theory? team building theory or anything like that. Um, I, I wanna use that as a kind of analogy to talk about the dynamics of local groups and the challenges in forming new teams like when Dale and I merged our organizations. Um, so the, I uh, can't see the laptop, but um, there are four stages of team building. There's uh, forming, storming, norming, and performing. And obviously forming is when the team first forms and uh, everyone is figuring out their roles. And then uh, storming is kind of working out those challenges as people are figuring out their roles. And okay, I have this role, what does that role mean that I'm doing? And how, how do I interface with this other person's role? And there's quite a bit of, you know, um, storming, uh, you know, uh, chaos even in figuring that out. Um, and then as that gets figured out, you come into the norming stage. Um, and that is when people are starting to gel together and they're, they're getting in the groove and um, performing is what the, the product that comes from that norming, after that norming, where you know, we are able to um, produce great work. So um, one of the things that happens when groups change is that they can cycle back through these stages. And there are a lot of changes that happen in local communities. People leave, people get burnt out, people move, people change roles. And then we come right back to the storming stage sometimes where people are now trying to figure out the relationship with the new person and how does that go. And um, if you're at work, a new person comes in, it's fairly defined, you get paid to be there, so you have some motivation to work it out. Um, and uh, in a volunteer community, that's not necessarily the case. Um, so I find when I visit with local groups around the country that it gets discouraging, this, uh, this cycling back into the different stages and trying to get back to that performing stage. And so I think it's really important for organizations to understand that this is a thing and it's normal and that we're working toward that norming and performing stage um, because I, f I find that 
uh, people can get very discouraged when they have these challenges from the storming stage. So, um, and I just want to, I just want to kind of, I have a little, yeah, so like you can go back from norming to storming, you can go into performing, uh, back to storming, and um, so there are various different ways that you can cycle through this, this cycle, and it's not a perfect analogy, it's not a perfect analogy, but I think that it does a good job of explaining um, and helping us understand that many of the challenges and the conflicts that we face when we join together to, to try to produce something are normal and that we just have to work through them and kind of put aside uh, some of the, um, you know, well, this is my organization or this is my idea or, or whatever else and figure out ways to collaborate. So um, that's something that we've uh, worked very hard at at FBB. Not, I'm not trying to say that we had tons of conflicts or anything, that we worked fairly well together, but um, uh, there's still those uh, human things about us that, uh, that cause us to, uh, you know, get defensive or get frustrated or whatever else. And um, so I think that that analogy helps. Um, you don't have anything to add? Do you have anything to add? Yeah, okay. Um, so really I'd like to kind of close and, and turn it over to Jude by saying that, you know, we have, and he'll be talking in more detail about uh, the work that we've done on the ground um, in Ghana and how we put some of these concepts of partnership, collaboration, team building into practice. Um, but I want to I want to kind of close by saying that we have to be thinking and looking long term. The religious organizations have so much money. Um, we really have to be thinking about how we're going to use our resources wisely and efficiency efficiently, and uh, let go of the the herding cats and find ways to build relationships. Um, because our movement um, needs, as Dale has said. Uh, we are building the groundwork for a long-term movement and we are building the groundwork to take over uh, the, the cause of philanthropy, the cause of ensuring that, uh, that everyone has equal access and equal rights. And uh, to do that, we need to, we need to work together. So, um, Hi, um, my name is Jude Lane. Um, I volunteered the second year of G the Humanist Service Corps being on the ground in Ghana. And um, when, I, when I joined this organization, I had a lot of hope in what was happening and in, in their vision. And after serving with them, after paying attention since, watching what they do since, I, I only believe more in, in this model and what they're going for. Um, I think that they, okay. I think that they are on the forefront of some incredible change in the way that we view nonprofit and international nonprofit work. Um, I grew up very Christian, a fundamental, fundamentalist Christian home. Um, I actually went to a Christian school to be a missionary, and while I was at school, I left religion. And though I still had the desire to serve internationally, though I still had the beliefs in, in this work, I was really lost on where to take that. Um, so I ended up, you know, I thought about doing Peace Corps, uh, I thought about teaching English as a second language, but none of it really had, the, had those answers. They all had issues ethically that I, I just couldn't find myself to, to work with. And uh, I ended up working stateside nonprofit for a couple of years until I went to a conference and saw the Foundation Beyond Belief table and uh, the Humanist Service Corps opportunity. And after hearing what they were talking about, I had new hope and I joined. Um, and within six months, I was on the ground in Ghana. And so the, coming in, the, there's obviously a lot of challenge. Uh, Ghana is a wonderful place with, with with beautiful people, delicious food, and just a rich, wonderful culture. But the culture, the religious differences, the economic differences, um, 
take a lot of adjusting as an organization and as an individual. And on top of all that, we're trying to do this in a new way. So on top of uh, just cultural differences, we, we're trying to do this totally different than, than anyone has before. Um, Ghana's a de developing nation, so you're coming in to a country with infrastructure differences, uh, water, electricity, transportation, learning how to navigate all that. We started our work in the northern region, which is majority Muslim, and so for me that was a huge adjustment, uh, the calls to prayer and just the culture around it, and it grew on me while I was there, but it definitely took a lot to get used to everything. Even concepts like time, family, um, sibling dynamics don't work the same there. And so if you're going to be effective, if you're going to navigate your expertise to make it, to make it effective there, it, it takes a, a lot of work to get to that point. Um, there was language barriers, everyday life, the food, how, what I needed to, to, to figure out for food, how I greeted people. and with this large learning curve, um, you have to be aware of what you're going through personally and as an organization, if you're gonna get to the point of, of making that difference. And seeing, seeing other nonprofits, Western, non, Western nation nonprofits on the ground over there, I promise you very few organizations are doing this right in my opinion um, and definitely they, none of them are going through a secularism, a humanist view uh, and vision for how they're going about this. There's a lot of issues with white savior complexes, um, and I mean I'm meeting people individually, not just organizations. I met people with, the, with that problem, had conversations with people. Um, they, there's a lot of unsustainable projects, people who uh, they do something that, the, the nonprofit does something that maybe makes a really pretty picture that they can put up on a website or in a flyer, but there's no maintenance to what they're doing, so the things fall apart pretty easily, and they don't take in local input uh, before they try to solve problems, so they don't really understand the problems before they're trying to solve them. A big example, um, there's a, a story of a community near where I was that had a well with a fancy, expensive system for the women to get to wash their clothes, but they didn't talk to locals about it before they did it, and after they built this, none of the villagers used it. Um, so it was a complete waste of resources because there were other cultural dynamics that were important. It was the location and, and how everything was set up that didn't fit the culture there, and therefore it was, it was a waste of resources. It, it never got used. And I saw plenty of wells that were also, they weren't working anymore, and they, they have no infrastructure in place to, to repair them if they get broken. They just put new ones in, and so they can say, we put this many new wells in this country, but whether or not those actually get used for an extended amount of time, whether or not that is a sustainable thing um, is really in question. And part, one big part of, the, part of the problem that comes into this is that real change is slow. Real change takes humility and it takes patience. We want to empower the locals to be doing this work we want, we want them to, to be at the forefront of what we're doing, to be at the center of what we are doing. We want local partnerships that already have the foundation, the culture under, cultural understanding, and the resources to be effective. And not only do we want to work with these organizations, but we want to capacity build for them. We want to be able to do things for them that if we walk away, they still have those tools, they still have those resources, and we just got to serve under them and, and give them professional expertise, give them perspective. Um, but if we are ever gone, we want what's happening to still be something Ghanaians can use and that they can move forward with. And we want to be critical of our process. It's another thing that a lot of nonprofits have an issue with, international nonprofits have an issue with. Um, we want to be critical of where we're going. We want to 
take every, every step to make sure we are doing it carefully and purposefully and be willing to change and improve if needed. And uh, this takes a lot of work. It takes a, a lot of time and it takes a lot of conversation both between ourselves and uh, the local nonprofits and the people that, you try to, that you're, you're trying to help. Um, but I, I believe that Foundation Beyond Belief is doing this. I believe that Humanist Service Corps is on the right path here. Um, one awesome story from the time I was there, um, if you can bring up. The, this woman, no, I'll talk about this later at the table, yeah. This is uh, Wumpei Safia. Um, she was from a small village called Kukuo that we were working with, uh, with local nonprofits and just community leaders. Um, and if you're unaware, one of the big projects that Humanist Service Corps is working with is within the culture of Ghana, there's, uh, there's an issue with alleged witchcraft. People get accused of witchcraft, uh, most often women. And it can often become violent, and the woman has to flee her home. And so the nation of Ghana has set up um, about half a dozen sanctuary cities for, for these uh, people to flee to, where they can be safe. But when they go, they have nothing. They, they have to just show up. And uh, sometimes they get to go home, but um, based on which region they're in, it gets very complicated. And, many, many times they end up staying in these sanctuary cities for, or villages for the rest of their lives. Um, and so Wumpei is part of one of those communities uh, called Kuko, and she was the chairperson of a new project we were starting called Community-Based Savings Project. And uh, when asked why she joined this project, why this was important to her, she says, and I quote, I have been living in this thatch house or ha uh, house with grass roof for a very long time and for the first time in my life I am setting a goal to accumulate income to live a better life by changing my thatch to zinc roofing through your trainings and savings project. So how, how, are, we, how are we going towards this? How do, on top of just this one project, how, how is her life getting to be improved all around so it's sustainable? Um, we're doing, we, we were doing agricultural trainings. We were working with farmers. And uh, most people there are sustenance farmers. So, so on top of whatever they're growing for selling, they, they're growing for their families. Uh, so farming as a whole, agriculture as a whole, is very important if, if we're going to be effective. But it's not just about feeding people. It's also about giving them science-based answers to the problems in their life giving them science-based, reason-based solutions to the problems in their life. Um, so we go through an agricultural program, and maybe next time a farmer's crop yield is, is bad, next time they have problems with that, instead of turning towards blaming uh, a curse or something supernatural or a person in that way, they can ask the questions of maybe it's my soil, maybe I'm not using water the right way. And so we're stopping the cycle to begin with because we're giving them better answers to their, their world without them having to turn towards the witchcraft to begin with. The year before I was there, uh, you saw some of those pictures from the medical teams. Um, that's also in Kukul, from the team before I was there. And they did the same thing in the medical field. So now there are trained government employees in that village or near that village that if some, someone's sick, they have someone to turn to that is not giving them a supernatural solution. They have medicine, and it will, it will most likely keep someone healthier, keep them from getting worse, and therefore needing to blame somebody, needing to, to find a different answer to what's happening. We can give them, we can give them a healthy, reason-based, science-based answer to their world. Uh, and directly with, with her banking, with her trying to save her money, we were, we were working with this community because it's so far away from even a, a town big enough to hold a bank. And on top of being really far away from a town that would have one, they, 
wouldn't have enough finances to even be able to start an account. And so how do you get them to where they're not just holding on to the money and unable to, to set up a process? Well, we developed a system um, where we had a lockbox with three different keys and the keys went to leaders in the community. And they would regularly set up in the middle of the town. People would come and give their money and it would get recorded and th then it would be safe and they would be able to keep a savings account as a community. And they were amazed at how much money they could save if they came together, if they worked together and if they had a system in place for this. And uh, they, they've gotten to the point to where not only are they saving for themselves, but they are able to give small loans to others in their community so that those people can also have this, so that those people can also be empowered in their own lives. She, um, the, the reason that the Wumpei is, is such an important story, so the, the first picture was from February 2017. Right here, so this is what she has for her business in February of 2017. And then this next picture, right here, this is her. Um, I received this from Lukman Domba, who was a volunteer uh, with me the second year. He's a Ghanaian, he's a, he's a local leader, he's a wonderful person. Uh, he's still leading there. And um, he sent this in May 2018, saying that she had finally saved up enough money for that zinc roof and just a new building. She got to get herself a new building and a zinc roof. And what's even more amazing about this is that for multiple reasons um, with, with Humanist Service Corps, we've actually had to leave Northern Region and we had left before this happened. So this is not us keeping this up. The community itself took the tools that we gave them, took the conversations we had, and they're doing this on their own. This is thriving, and we aren't even involved anymore. That's what we want to see. We want these people to, to be able to do this on their own. We want to empower them to be their own, their own people. So we do this um, working with these women. We also did a lot of this working in the education um, system, so we were helping train teachers. Um, so that they could go out and be teachers within their communities. We were working with communities just to encourage the idea of education, especially for young girls. Uh, often a family, if they have to choose, they'll send their boys to school instead. And we were there to show the significance of all your kids being educated, what that can do for you, what that can do for your community, and for your kids. Um, we, uh, something that I personally got to work on that, that was just one of my favorite things I got to do while I was there. I worked with this uh, community called Montambo Volleyball Club. And yes, they love volleyball. And uh, they already had this amazing system set up. They had a court, they were working their communities, working on funds, they had leadership. And I just got invited to the table. I, I, I got invited to see if I had new perspective for them. So I got to sit down with them and talk through uh, restructuring their leadership uh, so that they, they had more defined jobs for everyone who, who was trying to be in the leadership. Um, I got to sit down and write through because uh, they didn't have computers. So I, I got to sit down with them and, and connect them with local nonprofits and write down and have a vision statement that they could then send out to local nonprofits um, with the hopes of receiving more funds because they were already doing great things with the little they had. We, we were able to sit down and really think through a vision of the future, where this was gonna go, what they wanted from it, and develop um, something they could actually physically hand in to nonprofits that had the ability and the resources, local nonprofits that could, that could give them funds to continue what they were doing. So, um, as, I, as I said in the beginning, I, I really came into HSC with a blank slate on what it meant to be an ethical public servant. Um, I just wiped everything and, and, was, and was trying to start over with, with what that meant, where, where it needed to go. 
And what Foundation Bound Belief has taught me, what I've learned working with them, has really changed how I feel about this. It's changed my direction in life. It gave me a direction through humanism, through secularism, of, of moving this forward. And um, we're working here, I got to go into a new culture and learn from them as well and learn how it worked on the ground. I had amazing teammates who all came in with different perspectives. And uh, half of my team was Ghanaian. And it may surprise you to know that, that uh, two of the volunteers my year were Muslim. They consider themselves Muslim humanists. And so, yes, we're going to disagree on some big things, on some important things. But at the end of the day, we all wanted to empower the communities. We all wanted to empower the, the women and the children in their communities. They very much believed in these ideas. They believed in secular public service. And uh, so we, we got to come together from different perspectives and, and work on what was important to all of us. My leaders were willing to accept my criticisms, my challenges when it came to how we were doing things with where we were going. And from those conversations, I gained so much knowledge. Uh, they, they, were, they were wonderful people that I gained knowledge and wisdom of, of what this looks like, how this works. And they listened because they want this to work. They're, they are there for the same reason I am. They want this to go well. And so when we have those conversations, it's open and honest. And we talk through the issues and we find solutions to what's happening through this perspective. If, if, this is, if this kind of idea is important to you, um, we've, lis we've listened to people, to Dale and Noel, talk about how, how the church is, is shrinking in its influence. And if you see that as a place where secular ideas, where humanism can step in, where we really can come in and, and start making these huge changes, these huge, di huge differences in our world, both uh, local nonprofits, disaster relief, and international nonprofit work. Th this is an organization worth supporting because they're they're doing it right, and um, I I'm proud to be a part of what they're doing, and uh, I'm really glad that they're here. So. So we have a few minutes. And I would like to tie uh, what, what we've all said together a little bit um, and uh, talk about a couple things um, briefly. Uh, one is I, when we send uh, international non ghanaians to Ghana, they go through cultural training, they go through language training, and they go through training about Foundation Beyond Belief and our priorities and our values and the way that we want to do service. So it's very important to us to not send the volunteers in um, without some cultural training and some language training so that they can understand, uh, go in with some understanding of uh, where they're going. And uh, I would say as a whole that's not something the churches do very well. Uh, the, the religious-based groups, not just churches, I suppose, but um, tend to go in more with what can we offer, you know, what, what can we teach? And, you know, um, like Jude said, the white saviorism. Um, and the fact is that we have to build trust with the community because most of the uh, white folks who've come have, have not come for the with the kind of reasons that we've come. They've come to push religion, or they've come to, uh, you know, colonialism. They've come uh, to, to bring uh, Ghanaians back to the U.S. as slaves a long time ago. Many of the, re the reasons that we're there working now are because of uh, the white folks that have come in the past. So it's essential that we equip the volunteers with uh, training about the culture and the language, and that we go in um, working to build that trust. 
Uh, we're not visible in the communities that we work in. We work behind the scenes of our partner organization. So we work to build trust with that organization and then elevate that organization's uh, uh, capacity in their community to tackle the problems in their own community. Um, this is one way that we are changing how things are done. Um, and I, I just want to mention um, a few of our, do you either of you have anything to add before I kind of talk about the, no? Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit and just kind of run through a few of our values. Um, human worth and dignity, demonstrating respect and compassion for all human beings, reducing suffering and inequity in our communities around the world and around the world. And this one, this last one I think is a key value, engaging with others through honest, courageous conversations and investing in community-led solutions. So in the workplace at FBB, we are open about our individual challenges. My staff knows that they can come to me if they're having a hard time with mental health because I'm open about my challenges with mental health. We are creating an environment where we're having the conversations and uh, destigmatizing some of the things that uh, have been the case in the workplace in the past. And I'm very open with the board about it as well. Um, and that ties into our next value, accountability and transparency. Um, one of my personal goals is to be live my life more authentically. Um, so, uh, you know, that in and of itself is, is um, a difficult thing to do in many ways. But um, also for Foundation Beyond Belief, establishing systems for checks and balances to ensure ethical and efficient practices, recognizing when we have harmed others and making restitution to in injured parties, embracing, embracing organizational transparency and evaluating factors that contribute to mistakes. Um, and then the, the, the final kind of category is planetary stewardship. And those are um, supporting evidence-based sustainable solutions to meet human needs, utilizing natural and human-made resources efficiently and wisely, and preserving and protecting the diversity and well-being of all life. And there are many reasons why uh, we need to be doing that more, than, more now than ever. Climate change, uh, many of the challenges that, um, that are showing up all around the world with um, uh, human trafficking and uh, racial relations in the U.S., um, Black Lives Matter. And uh, we, it's very important for us to be aware of these causes and these issues and not only what's happening now, but why we need to do the work that we're doing, what decisions in the past have been made uh, that we are working to, to mitigate. Um, so I, uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope that you'll consider stopping by our table. I uh, hope that you'll, oh, my thing uh, closed up again, but uh, I'll put up a slide for a minute of, ah, okay. Well, please visit us at foundationbeyondbelief.org and or visit our table and pick up one of our uh, brochures and we'd love to talk to you more about our work and um, I hope you're inspired and you go off to do, um, see what you can do to make a difference. Thank you.